please take out your gas law station's lab sheet. Um, we're going to go through a couple of the explanations on there, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, so like I said, we're going to go through the couple of the more complicated ones right now. Um, you can expect there to be questions about the lab stuff, and they're more like conceptual questions, but there will be questions like this um, on the quiz on Friday. So please do pay attention. Please make sure that you understand what's happening in the different scenarios on there. Um, gases 2 is due today. Just make sure you get that in at some point. Um, you might have a little bit of extra time to work on it at the end, but hopefully you're pretty close to being done with that right now. Um, the gas law is the lab. That's the sheet that we're going to be going through today. That's due Friday. Gas is 3. Some of you grabbed it I saw already. Some of you didn't. If you didn't grab it, I'm going to pass them out later anyway, so you're fine. Um, that's due on Friday, and then your gas laws quiz is Friday as well. Tomorrow in our small groups, we are just going to be going through questions that you might have on either the lab or gas is three. Okay, so if I don't answer any or some of your questions today, you will have an opportunity to get those asked tomorrow as well. Okay, um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, the quarter technically, I guess, ends today, but we are going to give you till. <laughs> till Friday to get that stuff in. So if you have late work, any of those things, you can um, turn those in by Friday and we'll still give you credit on those for this quarter. Questions on anything? Due dates? Perfect. All right, we're gonna start off by talking about the Cartesian diver. So we're trying to explain what is happening and give a, a scientific explanation on why the diver sinks. Okay, so we have to understand, first of all, that when the diver's floating, the diver's floating because it's less dense than water, right? Like that's why things float. And so the thing is, it's made so that it's just a little bit, like a tiny, tiny little bit less dense than water. And that's why it takes a while to sink when you, when you squeeze it as well. Okay, and then when it sinks, obviously it's a little bit more dense than water. So we want to talk about what accounts for that change in density when we're squeezing the tube. So let's take a look at it. So if we blew up this pipette, or the, the diver is the pipette bulb, okay, bigger, and we look at the air bubble inside. The, the starting air bubble would look like this. It would be relatively large, okay? And I say relatively large because I'm comparing it to what it looks like when we're done. Okay, so when it's, when it's bigger like this, we're assuming that it has, um, there's less pressure on it right now, right, because we're not squeezing it. And that less pressure is allowing it to have a higher volume, okay? And that less pressure and higher volume means that the diver is less dense right now than it is when you squeeze it. Okay? So when it's at the top, like I said, it's low pressure, high volume, and it's low density. Now, you squeeze the container. Okay? You squeeze the 2-liter bottle. Whenever you squeeze it, you're adding some pressure to it. Okay? When you add that pressure, that's going to decrease the volume inside it. So the air bubble, I know it's a little bit drastic. Obviously, I'm, you know, I'm trying to show you it's not this, it's not by this much, but the air bubble is going to shrink in size, right? So we squeeze it, air bubble goes from being this big to down to being this big. So we've taken the same number of particles and we compress them into a tighter space. So essentially what we've done is we've increased the density of the gas. Does that make sense, everyone? We t like we, density is just all about how much stuff is packed into a certain amount of space, right? So what we've done is we've taken same amount of stuff, packed into a smaller s space, that's going to give a higher density. That's what allows the diver to sink to the bottom of the two-liter bottle. Okay, so if you don't have an explanation that is you know, like that, at least somewhat, you probably should change your explanation. Okay, you, need to, you need to know why that happens. Okay, does anybody have questions on that? We're good? Okay, the next one, ice boiler, okay? Um, the ice boiler, first of all, we took, we heated up a flask, okay? We got the flask to where it's boiling. When things boil, why do they boil? Because they're hot. Yes, okay, we're adding heat to it. I understand that. 
but they don't boil just because they're hot. It has to do with the differences in pressure that are happening there. Okay? So when we add heat to something, we have to think about what that does to the molecules. Yes, it, it makes them move faster, we're giving them kinetic energy, and that's going to increase the pressure that, the, that that has, right? That increase in pressure here is going to be what causes the water to boil. So right at the surface of the water, there's a little, uh, there's water vapor there, right? And as soon as that water vapor is reaching the pressure of the air, it's breaking that pressure that the air has, that's when the water's going to start bubbling up and boiling. Does that make sense? So it's really from that increase in pressure, not just from the increase in temperature. So normally when we boil something, we heat the water enough, we increase the pressure of the water enough to where it's higher than the air, okay, or as high as the air, and it breaks down into, it, it's able to, to kind of break that surface tension into the air. Okay, now when we did the ice boiler, okay, so on the left hand side, yes, it's higher water temperature equals a higher pressure. Okay, when we do the ice boiler, it's the same concept. We need the pressure of the water, the vapor pressure at the surface of that water to be higher than the air. But in this case, what we did is we rubbed ice on the outside of where the air was, right? So what did that do to the temperature of the air? It decreased it, right? What does that do to the pressure of the air? It decreases the pressure of the air as well, right? So now our water starts to bubble again. But now it's bubbling because we are decreasing air pressure rather than increasing water pressure. Does that make sense? So it's for, it still boils for the same reason, but now we, we've kind of done the opposite here. We've actually lowered, um, we've lowered that air temperature and air pressure. Okay? Um, at the end of class today, we'll watch a, a video that um, shows water boiling at different um, temperatures and pressures. We showed it right now here last year, but we're actually taping this. This is a class we're taping it last year. Um, it, the video must be copyrighted because it was like banned all over the place. Like every, so nobody can watch it. So I'll show it then after we're done taping. Um, it's actually pretty good and it explains a lot about um, air, or sorry, uh, air and water pressures and why things boil and why they boil at um, different temperatures at different elevations. Um, does anybody have questions on this explanation at all? Okay. Um, the last thing we want to talk about the lab, and this isn't necessarily in your lab, but we need to have a very good understanding of what what pressure really is. And you can expect there to be questions about pressure and stuff like this on your test, so that's how we're going through it today. Um, we gotta understand that in all three of these, these examples that I'm telling you, we're increasing pressure. And in all three examples, pressure increases for the same reason, but we're getting there in a different way, okay? So for example, the first one, the YouTube here, okay, what, what happened with that was we had antifreeze in there, right? When the pressure was greater on the outside in the atmosphere, the antifreeze got pushed towards the flask, right? When the pressure was greater in the flask, it was able to push the antifreeze out towards the atmospheric pressure, right, or to the outside. Everybody's good with that. Okay, well, when we put the flask into the hot liquid, or the water, okay, when we put it into the boiling water, that's when the antifreeze pushed up towards the atmosphere, right? So we know that we're increasing pressure, but why does that pressure increase? Okay, so. What we did was, obviously, we gave it a higher temperature, okay? That higher temperature leads to more kinetic energy in those molecules. So last weekend I was talking about this, I said, okay, when are, you, when are things going to be more active? When they have a high temperature or a low temperature? And you all agree with me, like, probably when there's a high temperature, right? So when they have a high temperature, they're going to be more active. That's when they're going to run into each other more, run into the sides of the container more, hit the antifreeze more. There's going to be more collisions in general. That more collisions is what's giving us a higher pressure. Okay, so it's not just that they have higher energy, it's not just that they um, have a higher temperature, it's that that higher temperature and that higher energy is leading to more collisions with everything around it, each other, the glass, all that stuff. And that's what we feel as an increase in pressure. Okay, the next one, now I'm telling you it's the same thing, right? It's an increase in collisions, except this time we have a balloon, we have the pump on top. Okay, so let's just assume for our argument's sake, Sake. Now there's way more particles than that in here, but let's say there's 100 particles in here right now. Okay. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to start pumping it. Let's say I pump to where there's 1,000 particles in there. Are those 1,000 particles going to run into each other more than the 100 did? Yes. Are they going to run into the sides more than the 100 did? Yes. You're going to feel that as an increase in pressure. It's going to push more down in that balloon. It's going to push more on the sides. Like if you hold the container at when there's 1,000 in there, it's going to feel... Like you can tell the difference, right? You won't be able to squeeze it as easily. 
all that is happening because there's more particles. But ultimately, those more molecules is leading to more collisions again. Okay, that's where the increase in pressure is coming from. Now, it's to sound like a broken record, but the last one, we have the syringe, right? You took the syringe, you put it onto the, the pressure sensor, okay? You screwed it in there, you set it to like, I don't know, 15 milliliters when you first screwed it on there. You set the volume, right? Like the volume is staying constant in there. It's 15 milliliters. Or sorry, not the volume, but the number of particles in there is remaining constant. They can't get in, they can't get out, right? And all you can do is change the volume of this, the syringe. So what you did was you pushed all that same amount of particles that's in 15 milliliters down into 5 milliliters. So you decrease the amount of space that they're in. If you take a bunch of particles and you put them in a smaller space like that, where are they going to run into each other more? When they're in the smaller space, right? So that's what you're feeling is that increase in pressure. They're that smaller space that leads to an increase in pressure. It's from the more collisions happening that happen when they're in that smaller space like that. So when you make that smaller volume, you have the same number of particles, you're going to have more collisions again. Okay? So all different ways we can raise the number of collisions, but in each example, that's really the reason why. Okay? Questions on that at all? Okay. All right, we're going to talk about combined gas law right now. People have been asking us, okay, do we need to know all of the formulas? You, you're not going to be asked questions like what laws, Boyle's law, or that kind of stuff. Okay? Well, you do need to know <coughs> the formulas, though. And all you really need to know is this combined gas law. Okay? If you know the combined gas law, you know all the three other ones. All you have to do is use the information that you're given. If you're not given temperature for a problem, then you know you're working with Boyle's law, right? The temperature doesn't, you just take the temperature out of it. It's P1V1 equals P2V2. If you're not given a pressure, you know it's volume or temperature, okay? You just take the other ones out. So like if I'm you and I get my test, I just write down the combined gas law right away, boom, you know it, all of them, okay? So it shouldn't be a problem for you. Just input the information where you get it. If you're given all three, well then you're using the combined gas law. Okay, so we're gonna solve a couple from your uh, lab right now together and I'll show you like, just the e how easy it actually is to do that. So we have the P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. We're going to solve number eight. This is the Cartesian diver problem. Okay. It says the Cartesian diver has a 0 .050 gram of oxygen gas in a 0 0.052 milliliter bubble. Okay. The pressure around the diver. It's so this is going to be talking about when we're when we're squeezing the container. So we're saying. It, it's increasing from 1.0 atmospheres to 1.06 atmospheres. So it starts, you're not squeezing it. It's at 1.0 atmospheres. The, mil the size of the bubble is 0 0.052 milliliters. Okay, we squeeze it. That <coughs> increases the pressure from that 1.0 to 1.06. I want to know what is the final volume of the bubble, and I want to know what the density of the bubble is at the end. Okay, density tells us it's grams per milliliter on here. If we know something about density, waters is one, right? So when we get a final answer here. If it's sinking in our final answer, our density should be a little bit more than one. If we found the density of it right now, which we take this guy divided by 0 0.052, it'd be a little bit less than one, okay? <coughs> so I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here. What we need to do first is just find out what our V2 is. So in this case, we're not given a temperature in this problem at all, right? That means we can just assume that our temperature remains constant. We don't need to worry about it. We don't need to do combined gas law. So what we're going to do is just get rid of our T1 and get rid of our T2. So then we're left with Boyle's law here. So we have P1 v V1 equals P2 V2. Okay. Now we're going to just plug our values in. So it says our initial pressure when we're just sitting there is 1.0 atmospheres. So we write 1.0 atmospheres. Okay. In the beginning of the problem, it says. Uh, the oxygen gas is in a 0 0.052 milliliter bubble. We're worried about that bubble right now, so here we're going to put 0 0.052 milliliters for our V1. <coughs> okay, next. You're going to write equals, and then your P2, which we said when we squeeze it, our pressure goes up to 1.06 atmospheres times our V2, which is our unknown in this case. So we do not know what V2 is. Okay, you can solve this right now. This is as far as I'm gonna go. I'm not writing the answer up here. It's, all you gotta do is multiply one times 0 0.052 divided by 1.06, and that's gonna give you your V2. 
Okay, that's the first step. That's going to tell you what the volume is. V2. Now, how do we get density? Well, density is grams per milliliter, right? So, we're going to take and have it, our density that we want to find equals, it's going to be our grams at the top of the problem tells us, okay, right here it tells us it's grams per milliliter, right? How much mass we can fit in a certain amount of space. So, our mass, which is our grams, divided by whatever the answer you got for your V2. And that's going to tell you what the density is. Now we said it should be something that's a little bit greater than 1. Otherwise, it's not going to sink. Okay? So you're taking that 0 0.050 and dividing it by whatever you got for your V2 right there. I think it's your V2 probably should have been like 0 0.049 something. Yes? What? No, otherwise you're not going to get one more than 1. 2.049. You know what I'm saying? Like then it's going to be 1. You're a 1. Calculator missed it. I don't know. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Are we good on this one right now? Yes. Raise your hand if you're not. Okay, perfect. Okay, number three. This is the last one we're gonna do from this. Just talking through some of the things on here again. It says you're carrying home a helium balloon. In the store, the temperature is 74 degrees Celsius, and the volume of the gas is five liters. When you go outside, the temperature drops to 10 degrees Celsius. What is the volume of the balloon when you are outside? So, once again, here, we're not given a pressure, right? We're given a volume, we're given a temperature. So if we're not given a pressure, we just use the combined gas law, we get rid of that pressure, we have V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. Perfect. The next step, we have to convert Celsius to Kelvin here. Okay, so you cannot sit there and stay in 74 degrees Celsius and in 10 degrees Celsius. It's got to it's gotta get converted to Kelvin. And for... For you to do that, it's easy. You just add 273. Okay? So you're adding 273 to, to both of those. Okay? It says then, the, the uh, store temperature is 74 degrees Celsius. The volume is 5 liters. So our V1 is 5 liters. Our T1 is going to be 347 Kelvin. Okay? That's just, I mean, that's 273 plus 74. Next. That's going to equal, we want to find the final volume, so we're not going to be given a V2. It's going to equal our V2 over 283 Kelvin. Okay, so that's how you'd set that one up. You punch that in right now. It's just cross multiply and divide. If you, if you haven't done this one, it's 5 times 283, you divide by 347. <coughs> yes, JC. Questions on this? Sweet. Okay, the assumptions of kinetic molecular theory. I'm just putting this up here because you have to have some like general awareness of these. Okay, you need to know that gases are made of tiny particles that are far apart. You should already probably know that. That they have elastic collisions. 
that they travel in continuous straight line random motion, that they do not attract or repel, and that the kinetic energy depends on temperature. I mean, this is going to explain why or a lot of things for our laws and why gases have some of the properties that I'm going to talk about on the next slide. So, you, like I said, we just we need to know this. Okay, something about this. We need to know something about the gas properties. We need to know that, that they expand to fill containers. Okay, if if I heat gases, they're going to expand more. That's like when we did the balloon experiment that's on here. When we heated them, we gave more kinetic energy. The gas expanded more. It was able to push out the sides of that balloon. Okay, we need to know that they're fluid. Okay, all we t are talking about when we're saying they're fluid, it's because there's a lack of attractive forces. So if we look at the solid here, right here, solids can't pour. Like we can't, we can't pour a solid out, right? Why not? Because it's all stuck together, right? And they have strong attractive forces there. Okay, it doesn't break apart at all. Liquids have a little bit less attractive force. That's why we can pour things like water. I mean, you guys have heard probably the term viscosity before. The more those attractive forces are, the less easy, for lack of a better word, it is to pour something. Okay, so like honey or whatever. Okay, then gases have even less attractive forces than that. So even though that you can't really see this happen, um, you can pour a gas um, just like you can a liquid or a solid. Actually, there's a cool demo I wish I kind of would have did it today where you can actually like pour CO2 and like put out a candle like that. And it shows you that gases really are fluid. Um, the third thing on here is that they have low density. So once again, this has to do with attractive forces as well. Um, and it has to do with the space between them, right? So solids really don't have a whole lot of space there. So generally speaking, like as a whole, solids are going to be more dense. Okay? Liquids, there's a little bit more space. They're not quite as tightly packed together. So they have a little bit you know, less density. And then gases, the particles are very far apart. So you can see that gases are very, very low density. And okay, we need to know that. Because of that low density and because they're far apart, they're able to be compressed. We know that we could take that. We did this with the syringe, right? We were able to pre compress the syringe even though there was already a set volume of gas in there. And that's because there is a lot of space there, so we can press them together. Um, and the last thing on here is they can diffuse and infuse. Now, diffusion just talks about, like, you know, if we had a divider up in the room and we take it out, well, gas is going to be able to go to that other part of the room. Um, effusion just says that gases can go through a, a tiny opening. You know, so if there's a if there's a fire across the hall and we close the door, like there's probably going to be smoke that comes in here. There's going to be CO2 and even if we have the door closed, right? Because it can get through the bottom and the cracks of the door. It's because gases can infuse. They can fit through those small openings like that. Okay, questions on any of these? All right, last thing that we're going to talk about for, oh, no, sorry, two more things. Um, we have to talk about pressure conversion. So you have to know these pressures, guys. I'm Like, if you don't know them, Flash cards, okay, perfect. So you got to know one atmosphere, 760 torr, 760 millimeters mercury, 14.7 psi, and 101.3 kilopascals. Okay, you got to know how to do conversions. They're they're all just one step T chart problems, right? So you're gonna right now just try it. Convert 43 kPa into millimeters mercury. If you can do this one, you can do any of them. Okay, so like I said, right now I want you to go from kPa into millimeters mercury. So just try it. Um, on a notebook or something. It, you might want a notebook out right now, guys, if you don't have one out yet. We're going to take a little review thing at the end of class today, too, and you're going to need a scratch piece of paper for that. So just take a second right now, get some paper out. If you want to split a sheet with a friend or something like that, whatever, that'll be enough. Okay. I don't know why. What? Are you going to eat anymore? You're done? Are you serious? There's a lot left. I'm going to yell at it. You can eat more. Okay, just later. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, if we want to convert this, we start with 43 kPa on top. 
Okay, and then we're going to have to put KPA, if it's on the top left here, it has to go in the bottom right. Okay, we, we got to get this idea, you know, if, if, if the unit's here, it has to go down here. That's how we cancel it out. So put the KPA down there, it's 101.3. And then on top, we would put the 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so these ones are always going to be the same numbers in here, right? Like, if it's KPA in the second spot here, it's always going to be 101.3. The only one that ever changes is this first one. Now, it might be on the bottom or top, depending on what we're going to here but it stays the same, right? Okay, so you multiply them out, you divide by 101.3, you get 322.6 millimeters of mercury. Huh? Just do T-charts, please. Thank you. Okay, we need to know SCP, the standard temperature and pressure. Okay. SCP is one atmosphere pressure. Okay, that also means that it's 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury, 14.7 psi, and 101.3 kPa. The reason I'm saying that is because if a problem says, okay, your initial pressure is, I don't know, 13 psi, your final pressure is at STP. You don't need to be like, well, I have to convert one of these. Like, no, you can just write, you know. 14.7 PSI at the end. You don't have to write one atmosphere first and then try and convert one of them. Like obviously it's an easy conversion there, but it can be any of those, okay? And then the temperature is 273 Kelvin. Okay, last kind of review question that I'm gonna lead is this. Um, this really has every single type of <coughs> thing that we could be doing for this unit, honestly. And it, it, it's a combined gas law. It has conversions between pressures and it has conversions from Celsius to Kelvin. If you can do this problem, you're probably going to be <coughs> fine for the test. Okay, so it says that the temperature of 10 liters of a gas is decreased from 0 degrees Celsius to 27.3 Kelvin and the pressure is increased from 147 PSI to 100 atmospheres. The new volume will have a value nearest to what? Okay, so the first thing that you need to do here is convert either PSI to atmospheres or atmospheres to PSI. Okay, so I chose to do PSI into atmosphere. So you should set up some sort of T-chart to start this out. So you start out 147 PSI. You want to get this to atmosphere. So what you would do is divide by that 14.7 PSI and multiply by the one atmosphere. Okay, and it would tell you that there's 10 atmospheres of pressure here. Okay? You also know that you need to convert 0 degrees Celsius to Kelvin. If you can't do that, it's going to be a rough test. So hopefully we're okay with that. Um, but yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let you take a few minutes to work on the rest of this one. It is a combined gas law, so you're going to have to use um, all three variables here. You can talk with people around you. Um, take a few minutes and try and answer it. I'll help you if you need help. Um, so just raise your hand. And I'll give you the answer in just a little bit. Okay.
Okay, so um, I'll, I'll walk you through this right now. Hopefully um, you had a chance to work on it. If you're still working, that's fine. You can keep working. Um, but that 10 atmospheres is going to be what our starting pressure is, right? Because it says our pressure is increased from 147 PSI to 100 ATM. So we're starting at the 10 atmospheres. And it says that our, um, our volume is also 10 liters to start. So our P1 should be 10 atmospheres. Our V1 should be 10 liters. So we should set up just like this. We should be dividing this by our initial um, temperature. So our initial temperature should be 273 Kelvin. Okay, this is going to equal our final pressure, which is the 100 atmospheres, times our V2 because we're looking for our volume, and we're going to divide that by our final temperature, which is 27.3 Kelvin. Okay, so this is our setup. Now to solve this, all you need to do. Okay, rather than try and like multiply this to get it out of here, and then, well, that's all you really want to do. Is multiply by this and divide by this, but you're going to multiply, multiply, divide, divide. Yeah, so you're just cross multiplying and dividing again. Simple. Okay, multiply, multiply, divide, divide, and that's going to give you your answer for V2. If you did everything correct, you should have got 0 0.1 liters for your V2. Anybody that did not get that needs some help or clarification on this. Okay, um, you can take out a device, iPad, phone, whatever. We're going to play a little quiz. You can go to joy.quizzes.com. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll show it now. That'd be great. 